Welcome to hell! I'm Mac Chies, the host of the Genovision, and tonight we're reviewing Goodbye Volcano High. Now, before we start this review, I think some expectations need to be set. I know, this game's been memed to absolute death, and frankly, that's the only reason we're covering it. That being said, we're going to review it the same as any other game. This isn't gonna be a meme -y review, and questions such as why exactly is the game so memed on, what is a snoot game, and why is the lead writer such a terrible person are completely irrelevant here. We're taking a fair look at the game and nothing but. Secondly, this is not going to be a video where we go into detail about every specific plot point a la your movie sucks. We make these reviews for a lot of reasons, one of them for people who are considering making a purchase. So obviously we don't want to ruin what could be someone's blind playthrough. For that same reason, gameplay footage will be used quite sparingly throughout the review. Spoilers and plot points will be discussed, but only at the end of the video with sufficient notice. We're just making it known here because we're going to bring up points that seem kind of vague and unproven, it's really just because of what we're trying to do here. We want to provide meaningful commentary for the game while also preserving the integrity of should someone want to play it. With that boring stuff out of the way, let's begin. Goodbye Volcano High takes place in this weird alternate universe where dinosaurs are slash were sentient and anthropomorphic beings and live similar lives to us humans. You play as Fang, a non-binary whatever the hell this is. They're in a rock band with their friends and have dreams of making it big in the music industry and a lot of the game revolves around their pursuit of this dream. But it also follows other aspects of their life, mostly with their relationships with other characters and the various activities that they do with them. As you progress through the story, you learn about different aspects of Fang's life, other characters, and all that stuff. Goodbye Volcano High is different from most visual novels in the sense that it's really not a visual novel at all. It's animated. Kind of. There are hand-drawn animations, but I wouldn't say that it's a fully animated experience. In the same way that a rant Sona on YouTube only has so many poses with which they can express themselves with, characters in GBH only have so many animations which they themselves can express. Basically, this means that you will see characters making the same movements and poses throughout the game. To be fair, the whole experience is seven or eight hours long, so it's kind of ridiculous to expect that every single frame is animated. But yeah, the art and animation really isn't anything to write home about, but at the end of the day, it really does help to tell the story in a more fluid manner. Instead of a text box describing what a character is doing, they can just show the character actually doing it. You'd better get used to the animation, by the way, because the gameplay of GBH is practically non-existent. You never really control Fang, save for a few small and inconsequential sequences. The only real gameplay offered are these rhythm mini-games. Whenever Fang and their band play music, you gotta play them. I think it's pretty self-explanatory. Now I'll admit, we here at Genovision really aren't familiar with rhythm games, but we really hated these sections. The props show up all over the screen and they're so far away from each other, it's really hard to focus on them and it's really disorienting having to dart your eyes all over the screen. For that reason, it's also really hard to appreciate the artwork and animations that play in the background. You also don't really feel like you're contributing to the music, rather you're just kind of pressing buttons in vague correspondence to it. But get this, your performance during these mini games literally don't matter. You can completely take your hands off the keyboard and miss every single prompt and it makes no difference to how the game plays. It has no impact on how the music sounds, there's no game over, it doesn't change the story or dialogue, so it's like what's the point? Why have these mini games if they don't actually affect anything? Why have a challenge if there's no point to overcoming it? Other than that, again, pretty much no gameplay. But that doesn't matter. It's a visual novel. The point is that you can make decisions that change the outcome of the game. The point is creating storytelling opportunities for the game to branch off of itself, to create vastly different retellings on each playthrough. Surely that's something that this game does, right? No, actually. Honestly, if you watch the playthrough of Good by Volcano High on YouTube, you would get the same experience as actually playing it. Think a choose your own adventure book if a choose your own adventure book was just a normal ass book that you read from start to finish. Things don't happen as a result of player choices, they happen because the strict linear storyline says so. There's no point to replaying the game because once you've went through it once, you've mostly seen everything it has to offer. There's no meaningful choices to be made, there's no branching storylines, it's an overglorified movie. I played through the game twice to confirm it. I know that even when the game seemingly branches out, it always rubber bands back to the main line. I can recall one decision that actually results in something different happening, something that actually matters. One, maybe two choices, 
and that's it. You really don't feel like you're playing as Fang, making decisions in their stead and shaping the type of person that they're gonna be. You feel like you're just kind of watching them and, and, and nothing else. If I'm gonna criticize the characters in this game, obviously much of the interactions with other characters happen within Fang's social circle. I believe that's seven people. And what's weird is how the game portrays these characters as being one big friend group or eventually merging to be this one big friend group when it really just doesn't feel that way. It feels like they're more so three smaller friend groups that just so happen to come together, but the game insists that no, 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 all these characters are friends with each other. They're all interconnected. And it just doesn't feel that way. And what's especially weird is that they really don't seem like they're people who really jive together. They seem to have personalities that really wouldn't click. Not to say that entirely different people can't end up becoming friends with each other, but I, I look at this friend group and I just don't really see it. Another criticism that I'd give is how some are just not written that well. And it's not that they're poorly written, it's that they're not really written at all. And don't get me wrong, some of them get enough screen time to the point where they feel like meaningful, respectable personalities, but others don't. They just don't get a lot of meaningful presence in the game, and yet the game still treats them like very central characters, just as important as anyone else. And it's really weird because they clearly aren't. Something else that I can kind of view as a problem is that apparently in the context of the game, Fang knows these characters, they presumably have extensive history with some of them, but the player really doesn't, and it can create a bit of a disconnect every now and then in the story. If we're talking about characters, we may as well talk about the affinity system, represented by this atomic structure in which Fang is the nucleus. The closer a character is to Fang on the chart, the closer their relationship. This mechanic is entirely pointless. The opportunities for growing closer affinity to a character is extremely railroaded, and the affinity you've built with a character never actually plays a part in the game. It doesn't reflect in the story, unlock new dialogue, it, it does nothing. Okay, well actually now that I think about it, I think it matters one scene in the entire game. The entire mechanic is leading up to one specific moment in the entire story. At that point, I, I mean really why even have it in the first place? Those would probably be the biggest complaints I have about the game, but let's get a little nitpicky and dig inside the cracks. Character design. I'm not gonna sit here and pretend that I like it, because I, I, I don't. I mean, you look at the main character and it's like, what is this? These characters is like, what's the deal with their color palette? Looked like they were ripped straight from My Little Pony. And then you look at this one and you know, she looks fine until they hit you with that side profile and it's like, what, what the, the hell, hell is, is even, even that? that? I look at these characters and I think they look different. They look weird. I really don't like them. They screwed the pooch on it. What can I really say? And what's weirder is that characters for the most part wear the same clothes throughout the entire playthrough. Not gonna lie, that's just kind of weird. Now there's a few aspects of the animation we didn't like, obviously. It, it looks kind of stiff at times. But but the lip syncing looks really rough. As you can tell, there's not a lot of frames set aside for mouth movement, and it really doesn't look good. This is especially bad for sections of the game when a character is, say, singing. be pretty hard to get invested in the music when the character's mouth looks like a PowerPoint slideshow. This is just something that people are going to notice. And seeing as how music is a pretty central component to the game, you don't want that. Speaking of the game's music, I mean, it's, it's good. I really don't have anything to say about it. We aren't Anthony Fantano over here, but I mean, it sounds good. It's, it's pleasant to listen to. The voice acting is generally alright, nothing to write home about. There is one character in the game whose voice I absolutely abhor, and of course it just has to be the main characters. No, like, um, like when you do it you get lost in the moment, you know? All that exists is you and what you're doing and what you're making. There's no future to worry about, only the craft. But thinking about making it your life is, is scary, the stakes are... Higher. It just sounds really mumbly, the delivery always feels awkward and forced, and there's times where it's really unexpressive. Take this clip for example. We got an audition. We got an audition! For Battle of the Bands. It feels very restrained, not in the sense of, oh, I'm excited and I need to keep myself level, more so I'm voice acting and I don't want to wake up my neighbors. The problems with the main character aren't really limited to the voice acting either. For whatever reason, they seem to have the least amount of animation put into them as well, and it never really seems like they're expressing what they're trying to express. Take this clip, for example. Do you want me to help you figure out what you want to be when you grow up? Obviously, they're being sarcastic and mocking, but the character movements really don't reflect that. Or this clip. Um... 
What should I say back? They sound nervous, but the facial expressions don't quite match that. Overall, this character feels lifeless. There's just not a lot of movement with them. I guess I should also bring up the queer stuff, because that's something people seem to be parading this game around with. Ooh, a queer visual novel! I mean, yeah, they usually are. There are queer characters, and it does come into the story a few times, but it's not really much of anything. It takes up maybe 10 minutes of the entire game. Oh, well, Mac, you're a white cis, presumably heterosexual male. You don't know what it's like to be underrepresented. You don't understand the struggle of queer folks with an X for some reason. And maybe you're right, but please don't pretend that this game is sending out some sort of powerful message here. It isn't. It has queer characters, and that's about it. And then there's just the many imperfections with this game. I cannot tell you how many times we had to stop recording to make note of a glitch or an error. The backgrounds will often glitch out when changing, the audio is spliced very weirdly, sometimes you can hear the audio cut off entirely. It's really- Yeah. You can fix it. Hey, superstar! Ugh, oh, too bright- Sometimes it'll skip entire lines. Whoa. Yeah. I also wasn't sure Just to be clear, that's the game doing it. That is not us skipping the dialogue. If you look closely at some of the characters, you can see where they used the scissors tool for parts where they needed to animate. Sometimes the dialogue wheel will remain in place after a selection has been made. I recall at least one point in the game when a character just phased into reality. Don't know much about music besides what I hear on the radio. Me too. What is music? I can't even remember. Another point where the dialogue box didn't really align with the person actually speaking. Of course. Best spot in school, right? Best spot in school, right? Best spot in school, right? Another time where a voice actor seemingly flubbed their line. But it doesn't really work if you're on your own. If you're on your own. You're on your own. You're on your own. And so much more. It actually gets worse if you actually start skipping through the dialogue. I remember as I was playing the game a second time through, mostly just skimming through it. I mean, the game was just doing all sorts of weird stuff. I specifically remember it playing two songs over each other during the rhythm mini games. It's as if the game itself couldn't keep up with the player. There's so much more that I didn't get on footage, but I think you get the point. This game is just sloppy. And believe me, most of these are issues that persist throughout the game. You will notice them from start to finish. This is completely unacceptable, and it is a appalling to me that they released this game in such a condition where its defects are so obvious to the naked eye. Oh, Mac, you're really sticking it to the game. Is there anything you guys liked about it? Well, if you boil the game down to just its story, I think it's quite good. I think the characters are well written, have interests and goals easy to sympathize with. It's pretty easy to root for them, to want the best for them. The story isn't a masterpiece by any means. It's not going to change your outlook on life, but it, it's enjoyable. And depending on the type of person you are, you can definitely get invested and lose yourself in it. We've now come to the part of the review where we will discuss specific plot points. Now, if you're considering buying this game to play for yourself, we highly recommend you skip to this time in the video where we give our rating and final opinions on the game. This is a visual novel, so it's a type of media where it's obviously best dug into blindly. So you've been warned, we're gonna start digging in now. As far as specific plot points go, I don't really have much to rag on, but there definitely are a few things that kind of made us go, eh? One of the, uh, I guess, subplots in the game is Fang has this secret admirer. It's this bit. It's her. And what's weird is, even though the game seems to pretend that this is some sort of secret, they make it blatantly obvious who it is. There'll be scenes with Fang and Naomi, that, that's her name. Fang will leave and the camera will pan to Naomi, making this blushy smile. And at that point, you're like, gee... I wonder who our secret admirer is. Like, why have this mystery if you're just gonna make it incredibly obvious who the person is? And even if they intentionally made it obvious, all you're doing is creating another disconnect between Fang and the player. The player knows something that Fang doesn't, and that just takes you out of things. I mentioned the affinity system being quite pointless, and I think one of the best examples of that is this scene where you're talking to this person named Sage. Now, for context, Sage is a transgender, and there's a scene where he's coming out to you about how hard it is, being transgender. When I told my family I wanted to transition, they took it hard. They were accepting, but 
super uncomfortable. Okay, sure. Now that's a pretty big thing to come out about. It's very personal stuff. One might think that this scene would only trigger if you spent a certain amount of time with him or built up a good relationship with him, but that's just not the case. As I said before, this game is on rails. So this scene comes at a predetermined point in the story, regardless of your interactions with this character. And what's weird is that even in the context of the story, prior to this scene, you never really spent any time with this character or get to know them one-on-one. -on -one, so it really doesn't feel like it's a scene that's warranted. I'm sure people will argue that, oh, well, both of these characters are queer. So obviously there'd be some solidarity there and maybe, but the point is you have this mechanic. Why not use it? There is something that's hinted in the game. One of your bandmates and best friends, Reed, has this crush and even gets into a romantic relationship with this other guy. And what's weird is that it never once gets brought up in the actual story or dialogue. It's pictured, it's implied, it's hinted at, but it's never explicitly mentioned. And the thing is, this is actually a character that gets quite a bit of presence in the game. So you would think it's something that it would have to bring up. But no, one of your best friends implicitly gets into this romantic relationship and the game just kind of casually hand waves it away. And it's not just bad storytelling. When you look at it from a queer point of view, I mean, it just looks bad. It doesn't feel like this was put in the game to show that queer relationships can be lasting, legitimate, and fulfilling, same as heterosexual ones. Rather, it feels like it was just put in the game because it would look cute. As if same-sex relationships, particularly those between men, is just this cute aesthetic for people to gush over. Obviously, I doubt that was the intent, but that really doesn't matter. When you do stuff like this, that's gonna be how it comes across. In the words of your people, do better. In case you haven't realized, I'm not really that concerned about it, but I feel like if you're gonna parade your game around as one for the queers, then maybe you should actually put effort into your supposedly queer characters. The last thing I hate about this game is this whole meteor aspect. Officials continue to say there is little danger posed by this once in a generation astrological event, with most projections showing the space rock missing impact by a margin of 20 to 30%. But one local amateur astronomer is raising alarm with new self-published trajectories that show a much higher chance of impact from this massive object. Basically, in the game, at the end, a meteor literally comes down and kills everyone. Okay, well... It's implied. Now, I'm not sure if this is a spoiler because the Steam page straight up tells you that, yes, everyone dies. Okay, well... It's implied. And it's just really weird because the way the game presents it, it tries to make the player think that it's this uncertainty. That, ooh, the meteor might hit, but it might not. Mystery. Well, the store page description literally tells you what's gonna happen, so it's kind of pointless to try and dance around it. And let's just be real, this whole thing where everyone dies at the end, it's just lame. Oh no, Mac, you don't understand. Everyone dying at the end is supposed to be bittersweet. It's supposed to teach you to make the most of life, even if it seems pointless. Stoically facing death will stoically put your face in these nuts, pal. Look, people can make of it what they want, and admittedly it does pull off the whole bittersweet ending very well, but let's be honest, it just makes the whole thing incredibly lame. The relationships you build, the way you mature, the trials and tribulations you go through really means nothing because you and everyone you did it with is dead. You don't leave behind the legacy, you just freaking die along with everyone else. It's just lame, what else can you really say? Oh yeah, remember that gay love interest I was talking about? The game ends with the characters holding this concert at the end of the world, and this guy doesn't even get to be backstage with his own boyfriend during the world's final moments. Yeah, he's gotta stand in the crowd like everyone else. I mean, that's just tough, buddy. That's just tough. Alright, spoilers over, time for the final thoughts. Goodbye Volcano High is a visual novel with an admittedly decent story, but is ultimately held back by its overly strict and on-the-rail story and extremely sloppy presentation. It is not at all a representative of what visual novels can or should be. I'm giving this one a 4.5 out of 10. Now to the question of to buy or not to buy. I would not recommend purchasing this visual novel. There's just no substance or depth here and the lack of polish really seals its fate, especially considering its hefty price tag of $30. I mean, wow! You'd have to have a lot of pride in your work to charge $30 for it. Pride, which is almost entirely misplaced. But hey, you know what you're buying. If you're just in it for the story and you don't care about the very features that make visual novels so unique in this industry, well, Meh. Yeah. At the very least, if you're gonna get it, get it on sale. But that's a review of Goodbye Volcano High. Now, if you're new here, welcome. If you're not, welcome back. You've just watched a video from the Jetavision. If you want to keep up to date with our game and movie reviews, subscribe to the channel, follow the Twitter, and join the Discord. Mac Cheese the Jetavision, signing out. You all have a good one. Yeah.